Great. Our last speaker for this session is um, Romuald Liepers, um, local here from France. He is going to finish with um, looking at mental fatigue uh, and performance in the triathlon. Over to you. Right. Okay, folks, we're ready to go. So, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for having given me the opportunity to speak this afternoon on concepts that are somewhat different as compared to what has been presented to date. I will be talking to you about mental fatigue. And so this my presentation is entitled Mental Fatigue and Performance in Triathlon. I will be talking about other things than just mental fatigue. The purpose of the presentation is to make you aware, using scientific arguments, that mental Preparation is necessary to perform at the highest possible level. So finally, well, performance in endurance, especially in triathlon, boils down to the ability an athlete has to resist, to the desire to slow down, to give up. And this is usually at the end of the race in English. We call this, it's this uh, ability to resist this desire to stop. And I will tell you that there are different possibilities to explain this need to maintain the exercise when you have to continue a given performance. One of the classic models that makes it possible to explain why an athlete would give up or slow down is physiological. It means that we slow down or stop or give up when the muscles are tired. Why could the muscle get tired? Well, for through different mechanisms, which you see on the slide, either lactic acid buildup, high core temperature, depleted energy stores within the muscles, or an inadequate delivery of oxygen to the muscles. This seems rational, and this is what we had thought for a long time, but uh, we discovered that there are other theories that can explain why athletes slow down. Why this model is insufficient. Why is this model insufficient? Because we can easily show this. Uh, uh, an English physiologist showed this, that if we ask that there be a constant um, high intensity aerobic exercise, here we see it. You see these black dots. This is 80% of pa maximal aerobic uh, power. And throughout this prolonged exercise, if we ask the person to carry a sprint, that these are the white circles, we see gradually that as this prolongs, the maximal power diminishes and that's normal but we see that when the subject is exhausted and can no longer follow the instruction to maintain 80 percent this person will stop in the seconds to come we ask for a sprint and we see that indeed a sprint can be maintained can be performed which is four times higher what does this show it shows that fatigue itself is not able to explain why athletes stop the exercise or give up so this means that there are certainly other hypotheses other theories that could explain why the athlete would give up at maximum effort one approach which talks about cognitive aspects was proposed by a South African, um, Tim Knox, who's a physiologist. This is called the central governor model, and it says that if an athlete slows down or stops, it's simply to protect the integrity of his physiological system. 
How does the system work? Well, the system, according to his theory, is regulated subconsciously and by integrating all the information from the body, the physiological information from the muscles, the feedback from the cardiovascular system and renal system and cardi the pulmonary system. These are the related information. So all these various systems lead this subconscious center to say we must stop this to prevent a physiological danger. According to this theory, fatigue is seen as a protective system. So when we're tired, we stop in order not to go too far in deterioration of homeostasis. There are two specific limits. One is, to, to date, no neuroanatomical substance has been identified as playing this role. The second limit is that when you do exercise which is a d predominantly eccentric, that is um, a down slope or downhill race. You can have some uh, str strong pains. So in this system, the body could give the, the person a signal that you either slow down during the descent or you stop in order to prevent muscular damage. So this central governor model also has certain limits, which suggested a third model, which I will now present to you, and is the psychobiological model. And it's Marcora, who is a physiologist who came up with this. And the notion of performance involves the psychology of the subject with regard to stopping the exercise. So what does Marcora propose? He says that if a subject stops or slows down, it's simply because he is or she is not necessarily motivated enough to continue the effort or exercise asked of him or her. So it's emotional or psychological. So it's the perception of the effort. It's the rate of perceived effort. So it, the athlete thinks this seems more than what he or she can do. So it's the perception of the effort that would actually be li limiting us. So that means the subject is conscious of what he or she's doing, and it's a conscious stopping of the exercise, as opposed to the previous one, which was subconscious. So what are the arguments that plead in favor of this model? Well, before speaking of arguments, I could specify more about this model. You see here, this model is based on a theory that Brehm uh, put forth and one of motivation. And as I had already said, it's task disengagement, either slop, stopping or slowing down when the exercise seems to be impossible vis-a-vis -vis what we can invest into it physically and mentally. So each person has a an effort tolerance threshold. And when the person's below that, they can continue, but when they get past to it, they will voluntarily stop the exercise. So this effort tolerance um, threshold can be played with. There are external factors, and we, we know these with regard, for example, see a person's already carried out this exercise, they know whether or not they can complete it. It also depends on the knowledge of the task of the task if you know the knowledge of the distance to be covered if you know what it takes to complete it you can be motivated to do it the other parameters which are strong are as I've already said the motivation intrinsic motivation and the perceived exertion required to do it so the rate of perceived ex exertion how can we we uh, measure this. Well, we have this scale that's proposed by Borg. It goes from 6 to 20. There's another that goes to, from 0 to 10. 6 to 20, where does that come from? Well, this is the maximal heart rate divided by 10. 
fréquence cardiaque quand on est so, jusqu'à 200 maximum. This is basically 6 is at rest and 20 is the maximal exertion. So it's a linear uh, representation of the intensity of the effort. Now, to bring it back to motivation, to see how that this can be put into a model, somebody who's got low motivation would very quickly reach this maximal rate of perceived effort in a short time. But someone who is highly motivated to do the exercise would reach this maximal level much later in the exercise. So this feeling or perception of a maximal exertion would come much later. Now that I've convinced you that this perception of the effort is very important in being able to go as far as they can, the question is how can we alter the perception of effort, positively and negatively? Let's start first with this uh, perception of effort that can be negatively altered. So, Markera, the physiologist I spoke of, uh, did work which showed that one of the main factors, primary factors that uh, alters this perception, it's mental fatigue. Mental fatigue entails a psychobiological state which is caused by prolonged periods of demanding cognitive activity. It's very demanding as cognitive activity, so this is again mental fatigue. In English, there's a lack of energy, a lack of motivation to carry out the task. To sum up what you have seen, and you'll see more about this, mental fatigue is going to change, going to reduce or diminish the perception of effort. So you're, the effort is going to be perceived as requiring much more effort than it really needs. And this, this altered perception of effort will regulate in a negative way the endurance performance. The first study showed that mental fatigue could alter performance was Mark Caras in 2009. What did he do in his study? He asked the subjects to carry out a cognitive task. You see it here. It was a task that consisted of recognizing these letters of certain color. So with A and Y, or so AX would be correct, any other combination would not be correct. And they would have a cursor and a keyboard. This would last, it's simple, but it, it lasts an hour and a half. So when you ask them about things, they, they all say after that period they're mentally tired. Then we ask them to pedal until exhaustion, that is at 80% of their maximum. We, of course, had a control group, and for an hour and a half, the, the control group did something neutral, like watch a film. So the important result, which has served many other studies subsequently, is that when subjects are mentally tired, their endurance performance is reduced by 12%. That's significant. One of the limits that we could bring out bring up in this context is that these are not elite subjects, they're actively, they're physically active, but it would be good to do this with athletes. So, but 12% is a big difference. This could not be uh, explained by physiological changes because there was none in their heart rate. But the only difference was that the perceived exertion had been exacerbated in the mentally fatigued subjects. So these subjects perceived the task as being more difficult. So this gap continues to grow. So they reach eight, which is maximal effort, earlier than the control group where they go to one minute, 30 seconds, the mentally fatigued subjects disengage from the effort we are asking them to make. And this experiment 
was reproduced in, with another configuration by another uh, working group in Dijon. And so there was a 30-minute cognitive task. It was a Stroop test. That is, you were, they were asked to uh, tell the what the color of not the word, but the color. That's what the psychologists ask. So you needed to pay attention cognitively. In the previous exercise, immediately after this, the subjects did an endurance effort or exertion, and they had to do a self-paced, um, no, they had to go as fast as possible, and the subjects actually could go as they wanted on their own, at their own pace. And we saw that the mentally fatigued, fatigued subjects deliberately chose a lower speed, so their performance was changed by 6% in this study as compared to the non-mentally tired people. So you can see the difference in the two situations. There's a perception of the exertion when you're mentally fatigued. And there's a third study that's quite interesting. It's the model but taken uh, upside down. So another tiring one and a half hour cognitive task followed by a, an exercise on an ergo cycle, but they, the power could be regulated as it was on the um, treadmill. They set two um, exertion efforts. One was 11, the other was 15. And so the subjects could choose the, the um, rate that they wanted to go at or the power they wanted to use from either 11 or 15. So you see the two different rates. So you see systematically the mentally tired subjects would choose 11, the lower power. So when you're mentally tired, a physical exercise me, uh, is something that people will, let's say, try to reduce. They'll try to reduce the effort they have to make. These studies have been scientifically validated. It shows that you can change the perception of uh, effort. So what we want to know is how can we change the uh, perception of effort, that is, decrease perception of effort. In other words, try to make it such that the athletes see, perceive the effort as easier. That will enable them to perform better. There are different strategies. With recent data from scientific literature, there are four such strategies. One, the first one is called self-talk. It's like an internal dialogue. And this consists of learning to encourage oneself during an effort. And this is uh, thanks to a mental trainer, mental coach. So subjects who are well trained were asked to carry out two um, tasks, one at 80% power, and of course in the uh, control group they had regular training, and in the exper experimental group they were followed, and they learned this technique of self-talk, encouragement, which they would be giving themselves throughout the, I think they had, um, there were six sessions, so three times they would have this encouragement, and so they would work on this mental training. And it enabled the subjects, these were classic things used in mental coaching, and it enabled the subjects when they carried out after 15 days, the second taste, to improve the results by 17%. There were one or two subjects which did not respond to this technique, but overall, it's quite interesting because there was a 17% improvement with only two weeks of mental preparation or mental coaching.
So again, we look at the difference between the two exercises. It's the perception of the effort on a scale of 1 to 10. We see that in the post period, after this mental coaching, the subjects perceive the effort as being easier, lighter, so they can last longer because it's endur endurance test at maximal effort. This is one first example as to how we can improve perception of effort to be able to work on these systems of, let's say, self-motivation and an internal dialogue or self-talk. A second strategy, which can be perhaps used, is one where it's to help them see things as being easier. It's to work on emotions. How do we do this? Well, in two ways, with images or sounds. In this study, this is one of the first that showed that emotions based on images could, in fact, change physical performance. This, these are sprint performances. There's no endurance for the time being, but it's interesting to mention it because there are significant results. In this study, the subjects were to carry out three series of sprints with this feeling of familiar familiarization. And in the all the three sprints, they had to look at neutral images. There was an entire codified system of images. So some were neutral, others that were pleasant, and others that were unpleasant. You see here the least unpleasant. Some of them are very gory, but this is the least unpleasant of the possible images I could have shown you. So these three types of images were presented to the subjects during the sprints. Well, look at what the results were. For the three types of images or emotions, you see the results. The significant difference which we see in the three out of five sprints is in reviews reverse order. So you see the negative images reduce the performance. When you see a positive image and neutral, there's not much of a difference. It's when you have something that's unpleasant that you get a reduction in performance. You're get, beginning to understand the system, so I say that. Again, it's the perception of uh, effort which was more significant that is, the difference was bigger when there's a negative image. So again, this shows you that the emotional pictures impact this neuromuscular performance. And the sound, sounds could produce the same thing, so we use music. It's known that music can play on feelings, emotions, and in this study, which is almost well, it's one of the only which has used triathletes as models, and triathletes had to carry out three tests, each of which was carried out with music that's positive and motivational, neutral, or a control situation with no music. So the, there was a, this was going from a motivational to a, a neutral one. So here we have motivational, neutral, and no music. So when there is neutral or motivational music, you see the results did not change. However, when there was no music, we see the triathletes reached a level of intensity of the effort that was lower. So that's with no emotion, there's a, a negative impact. Even if it's not even that motivational, but if there is music, already there's going to be a better performance than when there's no emotion. So there is a difference in the feeling scale. So this is the association we have. Uh, do we associate this effort with something pleasant? So with this motivational music, we see that there, there was this uh, sort of willingness to stick to the exercise. And it even helps more if you give music that the, the athlete or subject 
likes. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the studies also show that the beat of the music is important to be in sync with the movement that will be of the exercise to be carried out by the athlete. Now, those are two ways to play on the perception of effort. Yet another possibility, which is quite interesting, and it's hard to set up for a coach, but perhaps there could be some concepts to be thought of, is working on the non-conscious psycho psychological manipulation. Uh, non-conscious, well, this is the use of subliminal images. This is one of the only we find in scientific literature. Subjects were to carry out an, an endurance task until exhaustion. It was a percentage of PMA. Uh, and they were to look at something um, neutral to have some, and then they, they would be in a neutral environment, but then they would look at this happy face, like a happy facial expression, and then it would hear, let's say, I'm happy, it would hear these, the subject would hear, I'm happy, I'm sad, or uh, a sad face, and then there would be like a subliminal message that something is sad about this. Well, again, the results show that even if it is conveyed subliminal, subliminally, the happy, joyful messages or images have a positive impact on the perception. You see this diagonal line, the time to exhaustion, we see some, some don't respond that much, but there are seven or eight that if you subliminally uh, show them positive images, they will have a better performance. And this shows that we can significantly affect the emotions of a subject. So the RPE, looking at happy images, explains how we can ensure that the effort will last longer. Finally, the last possibility to play on feelings on the perception of effort is the use of psychoactive drugs. I reassure you right away, what does this mean? It is a stimulant, a substance that can act organically on the higher centers and can change emotions and cognitive faculties. There's one caffeine. It's considered a drug because it has effects. You all know it's authorized since by WADA since 2004. It has been authorized. There are others. The ones in red are banned have been banned. Let's go back to caffeine because we can use it. It has been analyzed in depth and there's a meta-analysis which shows that consuming caffeine, they're um, expressed in milligrams per kilo. That means that for somebody who weighs 70 kilos, that's about 150 to 200 milligrams that's not that much. It's what is consumed by... Uh, uh, anyway, that is already what the athletes drink. So to come back to the perceived effort, this analysis shows that the consumption of caffeine, even in small doses, to the equivalent of two espressos, enables them to reduce their per perception of the effort and increase by 10% their performance. And this increase in performance is partly, and we see this in the uh, analysis, in a perception that the effort is not as great. So these are four ways to play or to modulate the perception of effort. But hypnosis is another way. Unfortunately, we have no scientific data that proves that uh, hypnosis is beneficial. Some are convinced of this, but there's a lack of scientific argumentation. There's work that has to be yet done on this 
to prove whether it works for endurance sports. To conclude this first part, which is a bit technical and scientific, we see that the perception of effort can regulate performance and can be uh, influenced by physiological but also psychological factors. Mental fatigue can alter endurance performance because there will be an increased perception of effort. What's interesting for a mental coach is to come up with strategies that will reduce the perception of effort in, during the competition or the exercise at least, because during a training session perhaps you could increase the perception of effort to uh, make this person become accustomed to making that effort, to pushing himself. To conclude, just some practical applications which uh, probably seem um, obvious. Before a competition, you, we will do everything to avoid any cognitive tasks which would not be welcome for an athlete. I don't know if there are some, um, I don't know if any uh, go, let's say, play video games before a competition. That's not something to be done or like interviews with journalists, which would be a little too, let's say, um, n well, not well intentioned, which could upset the athlete. That is something to be avoided. And you have to put the athlete in a pleasant situation. You have to try to avoid any unpleasant context. Maybe you can, you know, listen to music, you could have coffee. As you can see on the slide, you should try to erase the, the unpleasant and ensure a pleasant environment for the um, athlete. With regard to training, all that I have uh, presented to you is theoretical. Now what I have left to present is the uh, practical application. The mental coach would have to think about strategies to alter the perception of effort to are possible. We either want the person to be in the best conditions to carry out the exercise, encourage him or her to look at nice films or listen to nice music. This is a positive situation. However, there's also something that's interesting. You could put the subject in a difficult situation without diff cognitive difficulty necessarily, making that person um, carry out cognitive tasks before uh, an exercise. Or perhaps put the person in a difficult situation, even if that person knows that he or she has to carry out the exercise, to help this person fight, resist this um, mental negligence if this effort is not made. To conclude, this will be my last slide. What I presented thus far seems theoretical, but uh, some think that this is uh, something that will be in the future. Brain endurance training, that's how some call it. And this would be thanks to uh, using new technologies that we could have a combined cognitive and physical training. We all agree that we're perhaps not there yet, but perhaps in the future we m should think about combining cognitive and physical training. How will we go about this? Well, there's Google Renet or Recon, where you could have a double projection. This is usually to have GPS information, where you're going, and then like some maps. So like a cognitive task would have to be carried out while exercise is also being done. Some are already working on this, but the data has not yet been published. This would be for people who are at a moderate physical level. You know, it's not the level of athletes, elite athletes, but it still could give us an idea. So the take-home message for you is that, well, let's say, if your brain is tired, it will definitely slow your performance. So you have to train your brain. That's the way to fight this, the same way we, f we train our muscles. Thank you.
Thank you very much there, Professor Leapers, for a very interesting presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for that presentation. I would like to know if you have data on recovery after mental fatigue. Okay, recovery? No, I have no data on that. But what I can say is that in Markara's studies, where he would mentally tire his subjects, there wasn't a, like, he would leave, let's say, a 15-minute break, and we would see that the 15 minutes did not suffice to help them recover. I know that in the 15 or minutes or half hour to follow, the mental fatigue was still there. So, they, okay, well, we could imagine that if there is recovery of one hour or an hour and a half, mentally the fatigue could be overcome and not diminish the performance that much. I agree with you, yes, that could be possible, but we don't have data on this. So it's quite simple. Mental fatigue, I didn't talk about it. How can it be evaluated? Unfortunately, it's subjective for the time being. We do this with questionnaires, evaluations. We have no objective way to evaluate mental fatigue. We have uh, cognitive tests, but they're quite... This involves cerebral imaging, brain imaging. But, I mean, the easiest way is just to ask the subject a question, saying from 1 to 10, on a scale of 1 to 10, how tired are you? Thank you. I think we'll yeah we'll leave it there. Um, hope you enjoyed today as much as I did. Um, and just final little bit of housekeeping here from Yen. Aussi peut-être pour rebondir sur la question. Perhaps could I say something on the question that was asked? Some, we come back to simple things, but in terms of mental fatigue. Uh, and recovery. Well, I think the importance of sleep is very important, is, is paramount. And this reminds athletes that they have to stick to their basic principles. Very relevant statement. Yes, we see the same uh, results. When we sleep deprive people, we see the drop in performance. And this is again due to this perce the perception of effort. And there is a sport where we can draw inspiration, and these are the orientation runners. They spend their time doing this. They think while they're running. And perhaps for triathletes, this would be a way to vary their training. They could touch upon other, other sectors of training and performance. Thanks a lot.